All right. In this lesson, we're going to talk about type 3 ionic compounds, otherwise known as ternary compounds. Ternary compounds involve something called a polyatomic ion. These are ions that form when atoms come together. So instead of being called a compound, which has to be electrically neutral, these uh, particular conglomerates of atoms are not neutral, and so we can't call them a compound, so we call them polyatomic ions. Uh, most of them are anions, meaning that they're negatively charged. There is one cation polyatomic ion called ammonium. You want to make sure that you remember that because you don't see it all of the time. When there are multiple polyatomic ions required in a compound, you have to put them inside parentheses, and we'll see that tonight. Um, the final thing to tell you is when we name ternary compounds, the polyatomic ions keep their names. So let's quick take a look at a few of them. You should have this now. And if you take a look here, you'll see that the ammonium ion is the only polyatomic cation. Everything else is a metal, okay? Now, the polyatomic ions, because they're anions, they don't start until we get to the negative one box, which is something we were ignoring when we were working with our type two compounds. And there's different patterns and uh, so on and so forth that I can talk about later in class. Um, one thing to note, you will have to memorize the polyatomic ions. So you're going to want to get started on that because we'll have a test in a couple of weeks. But you, for right now, you'll be able to use your chart here. Okay? All right. Let's get into how we write their formulas and how we name the compounds. Okay, as usual, I need you to copy down the two examples. Got it? Good. The first step in writing a ternary compound name is taking a look at that first element or polyatomic ion, if it happens to be ammonium, and deciding if it needs a Roman numeral. Is this a type 1 or a type 2 ionic compound? So when we take a look here at aluminum and we locate it on the periodic table, we see that aluminum is in group 13, and it is not a transition metal. It's also not one of our special tin or lead elements. So uh, aluminum simply gets a plus 3 charge, okay? That means that it does not need um, a Latin name or a Roman numeral. This is a type 1 compound. So once we've identified that we have a type 1 compound, now we know that we've got aluminum. And the nomenclature rules follow. The metal keeps its name. So this is going to be aluminum. Now, if you take a look here, you'll see that we've got this conglomerate here, SO4, inside a set of parentheses. This tells us that we have a polyatomic ion. So that means we're going to be referencing our polyatomic ion sheet. So when we look up SO4, we take a look, and I believe it's right here, sulfate. Okay, there it is. Sulfate, SO4, minus 2. Okay, so we name this simply aluminum. Oops, sorry guys. sulfate. It's literally that simple. Let's take a look at the second example, FeOH3. Okay, so we identify the metal as Fe, which is iron. When we look it up on our periodic table, we see that iron is a transition metal. So that tells us that we're going to have to figure out which iron we're talking about. We also need to know which iron we have available. So when we do this, we see oops, that we either have iron 2 or iron 3. There's no iron 1, 
There's no iron 4 or iron 5, okay? So now we're forced to look at what's left. So when we take a look at OH, we've got two different elements again. This tells us we're not looking at the periodic table. Instead, we're looking at our polyatomic ion sheet, and we're going to find OH, okay? So when we do that, OH is hydroxide with a negative one charge, okay? So now we know that we have hydroxide, and we know that we have iron, right? So we have iron, hydroxide, we just have to decide which iron we have. Now the hydroxide is a negative one charge and there happens to be three of them. So with only one iron to offset or balance out three negative charges, we know then that we have to have iron three hydroxide. Okay, let's take a look at how we write the formulas of ternary ionic compounds. The rules are pretty much the same. Your, your charges have to balance out. The only difference here is if you require more than one polyatomic ion, you do have to put it inside parentheses. So let's take a look at how that works. Please take a moment and write down the examples. Got it? Good. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Calcium phosphate. Well, calcium, if you recall, is a group 2 element right here. So it's an alkaline earth metal. They all get a plus 2 charge when they donate their two valence electrons. So calcium is going to get a plus 2 charge. Okay. Now phosphate is different. We have not seen phosphate yet. Take a look at that ending. All of our endings up till now ended in IDE for the anion. So this tells you that it's not going to be on the, on the uh, periodic table. Instead, we're going to find it on our polyatomic ion sheet. In fact, if you take a look at your polyatomic ion names, the majority of the polyatomic names, or polyatomic ions, excuse me, end in ATE or ITE. And that's big for when you start working on memorizing these you want to look for patterns in the ITE and ATE endings, and we'll talk more about the oxyanion uh, pattern in class. But for right now, just take a look. There's a couple of ex uh, exceptions to the rule about the ATE and ITE ending, and that is cyanide. It has an IDE ending, but by looking at it or seeing it, you would kind of understand that you're not going to find cyanide on the periodic table, okay? The other one is hydroxide. Now students, where is it? Um, students often, oh, you can't really see it, sorry. Hold one second. There we go. Um, students often confuse hydroxide for what they might call the hydrogen. But hydrogen actually gets called hydride. Hydroxide is an oxygen and a hydrogen bonded together, and it has an overall negative one charge. All right, so let's locate phosphate, okay? Phosphate is right here, PO4 with a negative 3 charge. So let's get that written down. So PO4 with a negative 3 charge. Now, if we look at the net positive 2 and the negative 3, the least common multiple is going to be 6. So instead of drawing them all out, um, I hope you can understand that we need three positive twos and we need two negative threes so that we can cancel uh, everything out. So our final answer here is going to be calcium Ca3. Now we need two phosphates, so we're going to say PO4 with a two on the outside. Again, because we need two phosphates, we have to put that phosphate, PO4, into this a set of parentheses. The two goes on the outside. It gets distributed in. So we actually have two phosphates, or we have two phosphoruses and eight oxygens. It is distributive, okay? 
Um, we, the reason for this is because we can't change this number 4. If we don't have a 4 on the oxygen, then we no longer have phosphate. The name of the polyatomic ion will change on us. So in order to keep the name of the polyatomic ion uh, true, then we have to put it in parentheses with a 2 on the outside. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have cupric carbonate that we're going to write um, the formula for. So cupric automatically tells you that we're going to our yellow sheet, our gold sheet, okay? But let's just double check, okay? Cupric comes from copper, which is, in fact, a transition metal. So, yep, absolutely, we need to figure out which cupric or which copper we're talking about. And as you learn them and memorize these, you'll learn that cupric is the copper with the plus two charge on it. So let's find it. There it is. Cupric or copper two has a plus two charge. Okay. So we know that that has a plus two charge on it. So Cu plus two. Now, carbonate has that AT ending again, so we're going to look here on our chart. And if you've already found it, awesome. Carbonate is, let's see here, right here, carbonate, CO3 minus 2 charge. So let's get that written. So CO3 minus 2 charge. So the charges are balanced. So when you go to write the final formula, it's just simply Cu, CO3. We only need one of each, OK? So now you've seen how we write ternary ionic compound formulas. You've seen them with uh, type 1 metals and type 2 metals. You've seen when they need parentheses and when they don't need parentheses. So you should be well-versed in this by now, and now you can work on your problem set. Have a great evening.